We are uh, very near the end of the book of James that we've been looking at over the last two or three months. Uh, we're in the last few verses, but I want to be careful today. The passage I want to read to you, I actually want to take two weeks to take just a few verses uh, because it's a subject that can be a sensitive subject and in some ways something that on one side of it might be very simple. It's the subject of prayer, uh, but can be very easily uh, either misunderstood or misrepresented or um, lots of things in between. In fact, I'm mindful of uh, years and years ago, I was at a uh, spiritual life conference and a guy named Richard Pratt, some of you may know his name, he's a fairly well-known author and preacher and professor. He was doing a conference that the topic was prayer. And he said this, I want to do something in this conference that uh, I hope, or at least I want to avoid doing something. His experience that every time he went to a prayer conference is that he left very discouraged. Um, and you can see how that goes a lot of times is that he would leave thinking, I don't pray enough or I don't do it the right way. And anytime we teach on prayer and we come away with it um, discouraged, then I think either the person uh, speaking, teaching, leading or whatever hasn't done a very good job or we've misunderstood because how could something so uh, fantastic as having the privilege as children of God going before the throne of grace of our Heavenly Father and thanking Him for what He's done and asking Him to continue to be at work. How could we ever be discouraged by that? So I want to tread lightly today because I want to talk about prayer. Um, part of me wants to say there's really not a wrong way to pray except that the Bible gives a lot of instruction about prayer. And so God wants us to know how to approach Him, not just in the words we say. In fact, I would say not even primarily by the words that we say, but by the condition of our hearts. And the title I've given today is The Prayer of Faith. And I hope if you've been here over some, if not all of these weeks, we've looked at the book of James, I hope it won't come as any surprise whatsoever to you that James draws our attention on the subject of prayer to the idea of faith. The whole book of James, this whole letter, James has been saying faith is a fundamental quality of our Christian life. Without faith, everything else doesn't work either at all or in the way that it should be. And he's been reminding these people is if you are a person of faith, then your life ought to reflect that uh, that uh, faith that you have in all kinds of ways, by what you do and by what you don't do, what you say and what you don't say by uh, the love that you express, the unity that you have with one another. And here, I think he's reminding us, even in the way we pray, uh, it should say something about our faith. And lest we say, should anyone dare to tell me how I should pray, I'm not going to tell you anything about how you should pray that's my idea or to say, here's how I do it, do it like this. I hope to just give you a couple things that James says very plainly and like most of the book of James, he says some things I think that are just um, unbelievably simple, maybe not easy, but simple. But the Bible does tell us about how to pray. In fact, Jesus himself gave us the ultimate instruction. Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this. And we have the Lord's Prayer as a model. And one of the things about prayer is could be informed by that when we say thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven we are saying something about our faith that there is someone in charge our father who is in heaven not us but let me boil it down this way and this is I, I always sometimes highlight in my own mind this is the best thing I read I read a lot of really deep theological things about prayer this week in preparing for this sermon but here's the best thing I read and it came from an author named Stuart Briscoe in a book called Getting Into God and this is what he said when our children were small and we were trying to teach them to pray we had three kinds of prayer isn't that a good thing when you want to teach somebody? How would you teach it to a small child? Um, children's sermon-esque. Maybe that's the best way. And this is what he said. We, we taught our children to pray three prayers. Please prayers, thank you prayers, and sorry prayers. There's a real deep theology of prayer just in those things. Please prayers, thank you prayers, and sorry prayers. And ironically, um, that's almost the categories that James gives us here today. 
when he teaches us something about prayer. So let's read, I want to read verses 13 all the way through 18, although we're not going to talk about all of them today. We're going to save the, uh, the second half of these verses till next week. James chapter 5, starting with verse 13. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. May God bless his reading to us, this reading of his word to us today. What does James say to us? Well, he says at least three things, and we'll talk a little more about the third than the first two, but I want to skip, skip over those first two just because they're simple doesn't mean they're necessarily easy or that we don't forget them sometimes. What's the very first thing he says? Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. That's those please prayers that Stuart Briscoe says he taught to his children. If you're in trouble, what do you do? And James says, first, foremost, and always, simply to pray. Now, you could insert your own story in here in your family. Almost everybody has a family. It's usually the father and the husband that's at the forefront of it about refusing to stop and ask directions when they're lost. Anybody have one of those stories? Raise your hand. Uh, lots of people have them, right? I don't think that's just a male thing, but it seems to be more prevalent, or it gets to be pointed out more for those, but... Um, why is that so frustrating if you're in the passenger seat and the person who's driving is so obviously lost and will not stop and ask directions? Even in this day where we have GPS and phones and all those kinds of things, we still get lost sometimes, but there's something in us that when we're in trouble doesn't want to do this. We don't want to stop and plead to the person who is more than capable, is able to help us, and more than that, is willing to help us. Now in the being lost and needing directions kind of thing, we might rationalize in our mind, well, I don't know who to ask. I don't know this neighborhood, or we might think it'd be dangerous just to knock on some stranger's door, or maybe they'll tell me the wrong thing. There's all those doubts, but when it comes to our relationship with our Heavenly Father, why would we not stop and ask what we need to pray before God, that we don't ever have to doubt his ability to help us or his willingness to help us. The natural reaction to the one who loves the Father and knows that the Father delights in his children. Now that's two key things. Why would we stop and ask God? Why would we pray when we are in trouble? Well, first, our faith says that God can and will help us. But secondly, our heart says, I love the Father enough to depend upon him in my time of need. And maybe most importantly, I know the Father well enough to know that he loves me in such a way that he would want me to ask so that he could do these things. How do we miss that? How do we miss the love of God? The Bible tells us plainly how great the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. That whatever the wrong pictures we have of our earthly fathers, and we earthly fathers mess that up bad sometimes, is that we should be able to say to our Heavenly Father, who loves us perfectly, and eternally that we can say, Father, I need you. And James just has to give that quick reminder. If you're in trouble, and whatever trouble might mean, literal trouble or uh, relational trouble, financial trouble, uh, physical trouble, whatever that is, he says, pray, go to your heavenly Father. Secondly, 
He says, if anyone is happy, let him sing songs of praise. Now, I think James is still primarily speaking of prayer here, is to go to the Heavenly Father and say, if you are in need, say, God, I need you. If you are happy, if you are in a good place, say, thank you. Whether it's I need you or thank you, it is a proper prayer before our Heavenly Father. In fact, one of my favorite psalms, Psalms 103, uh, you may be familiar with this part. I referenced it in the pastoral prayer today. Listen to what this says at the beginning of this psalm. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Why do we have reason to praise the Lord? Because he has done so much for us. And the psalmist gives us some examples here. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Psalm 103 says, There is never a time in the life of a Christian when we do not have reason to praise the Lord. Now I do think this is in the context of prayer. He's talking about praying here but I think it's couched in this language because one of the ways in which we can pray did you ever think of singing songs to the Lord in that way that they are a prayer? Whether they're written that way or whether they start with dear heavenly father they can be a prayer. In fact we sing a not so hymn like song that says if you're happy and you know it then your face will surely show it, or some, sometimes it says, and your life will surely show it, then shouldn't that be true in the Christian life? If I'm happy and I know where all those good things come from, the Bible tells us that every good and perfect gift comes from above, from our Heavenly Father, then when do I ever have a time where I couldn't sing some kind of song of praise? And I'll just throw this in again. This isn't a verse specifically only about singing here. And um, the choir hasn't put me up to this. But I think there's plenty of commands. In fact, one person says without fact checking this. That it is the most common command in the whole Bible is to sing or to praise God. But I also notice that some of us don't do that often. Um, or we don't do it even in the time set aside to specifically do that. So I'd put in a plug here to say, if you're a person that in our gathered worship time doesn't think singing really is something that comes naturally to you, I'd say, don't you have reason to sing? And if you say, I'm just not a singer, I made this list. Let me ask you these questions. Have you ever sung a school song or a fight song? Have you ever sung a Christmas carol? Have you ever sung a lullaby to one of your children? Have you ever sung happy birthday or have you ever sung the national anthem? Have you ever sung anything anywhere? If you have, then apparently something in you says there is an appropriate time to sing something, right? So the case would be not that I never sing, it's just only on certain occasions. I'd make a case to you, is there ever a grander occasion to sing than to acknowledge what your heavenly Father has done for you? If you're happy, then your life ought to show it. Sing and thank your heavenly Father for all those things and much, much more. So, sing songs of need. Sing songs of thanks. Say, I need you. Say, I thank you, Lord. And then, let's get to a little more complicated place in this. He says, is any one of you sick? Well, we've all been in trouble and we've all been happy, but... What about when we're sick? What does he say? Now this could be the same as being in trouble in a physical way, but what does he say is something that the church ought to do? Don't forget James is writing to the people of God gathered in these uh, churches that he's writing to here. And he says, if you're sick, what should you do? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. Let's take this apart just a minute. What's the first thing it says if you're sick? It says, let them call 
the elders of the church. Notice it doesn't say that the elders are like an ambulance bay waiting to get word that somebody's in need and we go rushing out uh, to pray over them whether they want it or not. He says that people of faith ought to recognize something in themselves that there is a benefit to be, be prayed with and for and even in this sense to be prayed over. That is an expression of our faith and our unity. Our faith says that I believe in prayer and I believe that when we gather together in prayer that there's something special happens there. But I also believe that I am united to other people in a very special way. We call that being in communion with the believers. Is that there's a place in which elders in our denomination, and this is not specifically about just the office of elder, but those who uh, are shepherds over us bear a responsibility for us. And we acknowledge that to say, I am part of something bigger than just myself. I'm not a lone wolf Christian that says, I don't need anything or anybody else. The Bible doesn't know of such a Christian that believers in Jesus Christ should readily and willingly call for others to pray for them. Next week we're going to talk about the general responsibility of the congregation to pray for one another. And even it says to confess our sins to one another. Well, next week we'll talk about what both of those things mean. But here it says to call those in leadership, the shepherds of the flock, to come and pray for me. So it's an exercise of faith to do that. I'm saying that I believe God will do this, but I'm following this instruction, which, um, by the way, it says that they are to pray over me. I don't think that's a, um, something that says they have to stand higher than I am. It actually probably means that when the elders are called for to pray, it means I'm laid low, either physically, spiritually, mentally, or whatever, and that I need for the elders to pray over me. But this too is even an expression of faith and unity. Again, to submit myself to the prayers of others, to share with them what's my need. Um, even things that we don't like to admit very often are often the very things that we need prayer for, aren't they? The big issues in life, something about us doesn't want to admit that I have need of anything outside myself. We're a society of people that wants to say, I can take care of myself, I can get through this, and that we have some idea that spiritual toughness is a fruit of the Spirit. In fact, just the opposite. James has talked much about humility. And it can be a humbling thing to admit to another brother or sister in Christ, I need help. Would you come and pray over me? So there is a beginning of this act of being prayed for and being prayed with has to start with our own call of faith to say, I need God and I'm going to do it in this way. I'm going to acknowledge my need and call for those to pray over me. Then it says we, that uh, we, are called, we are to call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. What's this oil about? Now you want to uh, open up a Pandora's box, go and look up anointing with oil in, in an internet search and you'll run across some really interesting things. You do need to know this is the only place in the scriptures where it says to anoint people with oil as part of prayer. The Old Testament talks a lot about anointing with oil, but it's always things that are anointed. They are uh, uh, vessels used in temple worship that are anointed with oil to set them apart. There are some who say that this anointing with oil means that oil was the medicine of the time and so give them the medicine and then pray for them but that doesn't seem to be the context here. It also, some people make this a case, it's a uh, sacrament of the church of anointing with oil. In our church we have two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And prayer has a lot to do with both of those things, but it's not a separate sacrament that we do in some um, uh, ceremony that can only be done on rare occasions. More likely, it's a reflection of what takes place of those vessels in the temple is that when we pray over this, this person, and notice it doesn't say what kind of oil, how much oil, where to put it on the person. And so when we start trying to be too technical about this, I think we make this into something that it's not. I think simply anointing a person with oil, particularly as the elders are gathered there, is to say, we are setting apart this person for God's special purposes. And whatever the outcome of those prayers, even these prayers of faith, it's in God's hand because this person belongs to God. 
And our prayers are not effective because of who I am or who these people gathered around me are. They are effective because of who God is. You know, uh, the Old Testament people made a mistake in that, that sometimes they took the things that were set aside for God and they tried to use them for other purposes and it always came back to bite them. One time the Israelites in the Old Testament took the Ark of the Covenant. I've shared this with you before. They took it into battle thinking if we took it in there, it's like a rabbit's foot, that it's good luck for us and we surely couldn't use this battle, lose this battle. You know what happened? It was captured by the Philistines. Not only did God say, that's not how it works, but let me show you what happens when you start trusting in the thing above me. And so I would say with caution is, yes, anointing with oil should be something that the church does from time to time. But there's no special magic in the gathering of those people or the using of that oil. Where does the power of prayer come from? It comes from the faith in the living God. And that's why it says that when we are to anoint with oil, we are to do it in the name of the Lord. Because who heals? Only God does that. In fact, the next verse says, um, and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. There is an aspect of faith that is the key to all of this. You know, making someone well could be like this. If we began to use this as some kind of good luck charm or some kind of mechanism where we get exactly what we want, when we want it, how we want it, and say, all I have to do is gather some people together, get a bottle of oil, and uh, it will happen exactly like I want, takes faith all out of it. First, when we call to be prayed for, what does our faith say? Does it say, God will have to do this if I do it, or I will call these people together so that we will know what God's will is and we will pray that it will be affected upon us. So faith has to be the first aspect of this. We go back to the Old Testament. In fact, the the term, our God heals, you you know the different uh, names for uh, God in the Old Testament. Some of you have done studies on those, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, um, all those things. Jehovah Rophi is a name of God. He is the God who heals. You know what context that is in the Old Testament? If you go back to Exodus chapter 15, the Israelites have come out of Egypt. They're wandering around the desert and they're thirsty and they have no water. And they come to a place where there is water and they go to drink and it's not fit to drink. And you know what the Israelites did? They grumbled. They grumbled against Moses and they grumbled against God and they said, thanks a lot, you brought us out here to die. And you know what was done to heal the water? Literally, that's what the text says, the water was healed. Moses took a stick and threw it in the water. And the water turned from bitter to pure drinkable water. Now, does that mean today, if I run across an old, nasty, scummy cow pond and I'm really thirsty, all I got to do is look around, find a stick and throw it in there and there it is, pure spring drinking water? Or does it mean when we call upon the Lord, He will provide in our day of need? In fact, nowhere else that I'm aware of in the whole rest of the Bible does anybody ever throw a stick into any water and do the same thing again. So whether it's sticks or whether it's oil or whatever it is, our faith says that God does things because he loves us and he does it when we ask him because he chooses to do things like that for us. We don't twist God's arm by any of these mechanisms. So I don't want to make, uh, uh, I think we could err on one side and say we make too much of this and say every time my nose runs I call and get the oil out to be sure I don't get any sicker or we could make too little of this and say it's no big deal. It's a big deal or James wouldn't talk about it but James' context is always faith for us. Faith in the person being prayed for, faith in the the, the people who are doing the praying, and faith in the body of Christ. And ultimately, where does that come from? And I'll leave you with this picture, and we'll pick up next week. One person says that this kind of prayer, this kind of faith is like a big circle. It starts in heaven, and it's given to us by the Word of God of what we should pray for, and by the Spirit of God we're informed on that, and then our prayers return to heaven, and God works according to His perfect will in doing that. So how do we know what to pray for? God will tell us. Why did Moses throw that stick into the water? Because God told him to. In fact, at the end of the verses that we read, it says Elijah was just a human being, or your Bible may say Elijah was just a man. 
but he prayed and it didn't rain for three and a half years. And then it said when he did pray uh, again, it rained. Why did he pray those prayers? The second one explicitly tells us in 1 Kings that Elijah prayed for it to rain because God told him it was going to rain. So what does our faith do? Our faith says, God, tell me what to pray for. James and other places tells us how to pray for it. And it's our faith that informs on all of it. And I'll close with this idea, and I'm almost 100% certain I've shared this idea with you before, but I heard this many years ago, and I continue to run across it in different places. But there's a story told about Alexander the Great, that we can make a case he was the most powerful ruler in the history of the world. And there was someone who served in Alexander's court um, who uh, had distinguished himself as a particular loyal servant, uh, and he needed money and couldn't find any way to get it. And so he asked Alexander for help. And quickly, Alexander said to him, go to the royal treasurer, tell him what you need, ask for whatever you want and whatever you need, and I will do it for you. And so he went to the treasurer, and he asked for a ridiculous amount of money, more than anybody could ever need and more than most people could ever want. And the treasurer said, I don't know if I can do that. He said, I'm going to have to check with the emperor on that. He went to Alexander and said, do you know what your servant asked for? And when he told him, Alexander said, give him all of it. And the guy said, why would we do that? And he said, by the largeness of his request, he shows that he understood my wealth and my generosity. You see, when we go before God and we ask, even by faith, when we dare to ask God of anything, we demonstrate some measure of faith in us that says, I know not only God's wealth, in other words, I know that it was within his power to do this, but I'm also calling upon his love, his grace, and his generosity to say not only that God can do this, but that he wants to do that with me. How do we know what those things are? It comes to us by God's word, through his spirit, and even by our unity with one another together. That I can call on you to pray for me as an exercise of my faith in God. So I'm not dependent upon how good a prayer you are, or how good the words that you say, or how rich the oil is that you might put on my head. I am involving you in my prayer life because I, by faith, am saying, you know God like I know God. Let's go and let's ask him to say either I need it or thank you, God, or both. What a great privilege that is. Next week, we'll look at some little more complicated parts of that about confessing and the sick person being made well as part of this prayer for healing. So let's go to the Lord in prayer now. Our Heavenly Father, it is with great joy that we come before you today. We thank you that you're a God who loves us enough uh, to do things like healing in our life. And I pray that if today is the day that we find ourselves in need, if today's the day we find ourselves sick, that we would come to you and offer a prayer of faith, that we would uh, be informed by your will and your way and by your word, uh, but we would be encouraged by the promise that you work in and through our prayers. And so I pray that you draw us near to you this day. Give us eyes of faith to see all you are and all you do. And we'll give you glory and honor and praise from it. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.